About two months ago, I broke down a BlackRock paper that predicted much of the fiscal and monetary policy we saw during the pandemic. A paper that was published a full three years before what it discussed actually happened. So, you can imagine how excited I was to learn that BlackRock recently published its 2023 Global Outlook, an investment thesis from some of the top brass at the world's largest asset manager. So, what did they say and where are they positioning their portfolios? Well, that's exactly what I'll be telling you about today. So, don't go anywhere. Now, I usually start off these summaries with a breakdown about the company in question. However, I think most of you are probably pretty familiar with BlackRock and its antics. If you aren't, I'll leave a link to all the videos that I've done on it in the description, including that aforementioned one on the pandemic predictions. Now, this latest report is titled, quote, 2023 Global Outlook, a new investment playbook, and it was authored by some pretty senior folks over at BlackRock. These include the likes of the head of its investment institute, the company's vice chairman, and a number of other senior researchers. The first few words set the tone for what follows, because the first thing that they reference is the quote, Great Moderation. This was a period of roughly 40 years of low and stable inflation. However, as we've seen in the past two years, that time is long gone. Inflation is in double digits in Europe and came close to double digits in the US. Moreover, the authors note that recessions seem to be on the cards, as central bankers crush demand in order to bring down said inflation. This makes it that much harder to decide on asset allocation, especially as it relates to equities and other risk-on assets. The authors think that central bankers' intransigence on inflation is likely to be challenged the more damage that they do to the economy. While many of them have targeted that magical 2%, it seems unlikely that they'll ever be able to get inflation down to that level again. Now, the main question that the authors are trying to break down is whether the markets are adequately pricing in the amount of economic damage that we're likely to see next year. For example, they don't think that equity valuations are there yet. However, they do think that this could be a good time to start rethinking bonds, especially in a higher yield environment. Of course, one size does not fit all when it comes to fixed income investments. Longer term government bonds are not as favourable given the current high levels of inflation. That inflation is something that the authors admit will be with us for a long time. We'll have to learn to, quote, live with inflation as long-term drivers keep it consistently above target levels. OK, so that's the intro. It's quite clear that the playbook needs to be changed because the game has changed. So let's hop right on into the first section, though, and this is titled, quote, The New Regime Playing Out. The authors note that this new regime will be shaped by supply. More specifically, most of the inflationary pressures that we've seen over the past two years have been as a result of supply shocks. These supply shocks have crushed equity valuations and sent those bond yields soaring, leading to a weird outcome where equity and bond prices have been positively correlated. More on that in a bit. Now, these supply shocks that I mentioned are down to two main factors. One is the shifting of consumer spending away from services to goods. This caused those supply bottlenecks that we saw during and after the pandemic. However, another really important factor is the shortage of labour. While this was initially as a result of people voluntarily exiting the workforce, the trend seems to have continued because of ageing populations. The authors also note that central bank policies will not impact on these production constraints. Monetary policy can only impact broader demand, but not on what types of goods and services are demanded. While this is indeed true, they do seem to conveniently forget that central bankers around the world 
literally flooded the system with money during the pandemic. So they bear much of the blame for the high levels of inflation that we're now seeing. Be that as it may, central bankers are trying their darndest to bring that inflation down to 2%. And this is seen in the chart the authors have for us here. In order to bring inflation back down to the 2% target, they will have to crush economic growth by at least 2% to bring us back in line with the previous target trend. But, as I mentioned, this is becoming increasingly unlikely, and central bankers around the world are slowly beginning to indicate that they would be okay with an inflation target above 2%. Now, this is something I analyzed in a separate video on a Goldman Sachs report, which I will also leave linked to in the description. So, it could be likely that the Fed will allow growth to continue on the current trajectory. Now, could these supply factors ease? Well, possibly. But the authors do see at least three long-term trends that are likely to keep this above average. These include aging populations and the resulting worker shortage, geopolitical tensions and the supply chain issues they bring, and the transition to net zero carbon emissions. Now, that third one is particularly suspicious, given what we now know about ESG policies and who has been pushing them. But we'll get on to those a little bit later on. On to the next page of the report, though. Now, this over here is particularly interesting. It's a matrix which explains the author's tactical view of navigating the markets next year. How you should position your portfolio based on a number of different scenarios. The quadrants are risk on, risk off, i.e. risky assets or risk averse, and damage priced, damaged, not priced in terms of the Fed's economic damage. Now, based on which quadrant we're in, they say whether we should be overweight, underweight, or neutral on these particular asset classes. We're currently in the quadrant where we're still in a risk-off environment and the damage has not been priced in. This we know because the Fed's fund rate is currently 4.5%, and the terminal rate that the Fed officials view from the dot plot is higher than 5%. So, in other words, we are still nowhere close to interest rate cuts. Currently, BlackRock is underweight long-term nominal bonds and underweight equities. So, this is a max defensive stance. However, it can turn bullish depending on whether the market moves into a risk-on environment or whether the damage has been priced into the markets. But how do we determine this exactly? Well, that's on the next page over here under, quote, pricing the damage. As the authors point out, a recession could be on the way. And unlike in other recessions where the Fed was ready to turn on the taps, that won't be happening this time around. Hence, the notion that someone could, quote, buy the dip just won't be applying today. Despite how much you think markets have fallen, they still may not be fully pricing in the damage from the Fed. Although the damage is building up. The authors point to what's going on in the US housing market. Surging mortgage rates have put a dent in the sales of new homes. You can see this in their chart over here, which shows the fall. It's more precipitous than in any other Fed rate hiking cycle. Pretty alarming. The authors point out that it's not just the home sales, but also deteriorating CEO confidence and delayed capital expenditure. In Europe, there's also the energy shock, which has decimated consumer confidence. Now, as to whether the damage is priced in, the authors think that current earnings expectations haven't even adjusted for a, quote, mild recession. It's for that reason that they think that the damage isn't reflected and why they are underweight developed market DM equities. That being said, they do expect the Fed to stop the hiking cycle in 2023 and allow rates to stabilize. But then, even if rates do reach the terminal 5.1%, there's been no indication as to when these could be brought down again. Now, while this may be bad for equities, it's not necessarily all that bad for bonds 
Given these higher interest rates, fixed income assets are finally offering a yield worth parking funds in. However, the authors stress that we have to take a more granular approach to the types of fixed income assets that we choose to allocate to. For example, they think that investment-grade credit appears more alluring now. They think that these can hold up in a recession because companies have, quote, fortified their balance sheets by refinancing debt at lower yields. They also think that investment in agency mortgage-backed securities and short-term government debt could make sense given the attractive yields on offer. However, the one fixed income asset that they are not particularly bullish on is long-term government debt. That's because investors can no longer rely on the negative correlation that used to exist between bonds and stocks. For example, in recent months, this relationship has completely broken down and it appears to now have gone positive. See their chart over here. There's also the fact that investors are slightly more cautious about holding this longer-term government debt because of high debt levels and high inflation in developed countries. These concerns around debt loads and profligate spending are what caused that crazy sell-off in UK gilts just a few months ago. If you want the TLDR on what happened there, then there's a video for that. On to the next page though, and that is living with inflation. The authors believe that the focus on inflation has come at the expense of growth and jobs. More specifically, the restrictive monetary policies of central banks are leading to more damage than the inflation itself. While they acknowledge that the, quote, politics of inflation has taken over the narrative, this could soon shift to the politics of recession if the central banks and politicians go too far. It's for this reason that they think central banks will struggle to bring inflation back down to the 2% target. Hence, the authors think that even with the recession coming, we are going to be living with inflation. Yes, it will eventually cool once spending patterns normalize, but it is likely to exist above policy targets for years. In terms of asset allocation, they think that this environment warrants inflation-linked bonds and other real assets. The reason for this is because they think that the market expectations for inflation have always underestimated it. You can see this in the chart over here, where the median analyst expectations were projected out in 2020, 2021 and 2022. In an environment where the market always underestimates future inflation, you want to be in assets with inflation protection. On the next page over here, they have some tactical advice for investing in the new regime. For one, they explain exactly why shorter-term government bonds are favourable to longer-term ones. Firstly, in some places, shorter-term bonds are yielding more than longer-term bonds. In the US, the two-year yield is above that of the 10-year, for example. You can see exactly what that looks like over here. Now, in bond nomenclature, this is an inverted yield curve, and it's usually a sign that a recession is coming, so take note. Given that shorter-term rates like the two-year are above the 10-year, it, quote, reduces the need to take risk by seeking yield further out the curve. This is also a reason why they feel comfortable adding overweight to the likes of investment-grade credit. Strong balance sheets combined with higher rates are a great source of income in a recessionary environment. The authors also say that they like US agency MBSs. Now, for those unfamiliar, these are mortgaged-backed securities that offer credit protection via the government ownership of the agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginnie Mae. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then I've linked to some resources in the description for you that explain how these differ from other types of MBSs. The authors again reiterate that recession has not been priced in to corporate earnings, so that's why they remain underweight the asset class heading into the new year. However, when they do decide to pivot into equities, they will be more selective in the sectors chosen. The thesis of an aging population will mean more spending on healthcare, for example, which could be a boon for that sector. 
They also think that the energy and financial sectors could be good ones to focus on for a cyclical play. For example, elevated energy prices will bode well for the former, and a higher interest rate environment will lift the latter. To quote the deputy CIO of BlackRock's Fundamental Equity Division, quote, A bottom-up look at what our companies are telling us is probably the best lens we have into the future. On to the next page, and this is more of a strategic look at portfolio allocation. More specifically, we'll need to rethink long-entrenched views of the 60-40 portfolio. During the last 40 years of the Great Moderation, people were of the view that a 40% allocation to bonds and a 60% allocation to equities had the right risk-return payoff. Not anymore. That's because the authors say that they don't see a return to the conditions that will sustain a joint bull market in both equities and bonds, as we've seen in the past couple of years. Therefore, relying on the 60-40 asset allocation could be as much as four times as costly in the new regime as it was in the Great Moderation. This is best illustrated in this chart, which shows the range of estimated returns based on two different portfolio mixes. The point that they're trying to illustrate is that investors have to be more active and dynamically adjust their portfolio weights in the new regime. They've used the example here of an 80-20 equity bond split. The estimated return is slightly positive and the volatility between it is lower than with the legacy 60-40 split. The authors note that over the next decade, the longer term returns of equities will be greater than those of bonds. And this, combined with an assumption of positive correlations, favours a portfolio that is overweight developed market equities. So, what does this mean for you? Well, if you're an adherent of the 60-40 portfolio theory, then you need to think long and hard about that allocation in the coming years. It doesn't matter if you're picking the right stocks in your equity bucket if the correlation between fixed income and equities is harming your overall return. Now, this next page over here is particularly interesting for me. It's the impact that the ageing workforce is having on the economy. The most pressing implication of this is, of course, the lack of labour force participation. Fewer workers means higher wages, which means higher prices, which means higher inflation. While the pandemic was responsible for the notable crash in labour force participation, it still hasn't recovered to pre-pandemic levels. And it appears as though one of the primary drivers of this is those retiring from the workforce. You can see exactly what that looks like in this chart they have for us over here. And unlike those people who would come back to work after the pandemic, once someone has retired or is too old to work, they don't return to the workforce. This is bad news for the economy more broadly, as growth is likely to be slower in the coming years than in previous ones. That's because less will be produced and older people generally consume less than younger people do. On top of this, an ageing population is going to mean more government spending and debt to care for these people. I talked about this in much greater detail in my video about population decline, which I will leave in the usual spot for you folks. Anywho, this next page here is titled, quote, The Next World Order, and it's all about the increasing geopolitical risk we are now experiencing. There's no doubt that the world has become pretty unstable over the past three years. In fact, according to the authors, this is the most fraught global environment since World War II. The end result of this is geopolitical fragmentation, where globalization is reversed and broader cooperation is curtailed. This implies that more goods have to be sourced and produced locally, which of course comes with higher costs, i.e., more inflation. As an example, the authors cite the sanctions that were placed on Russia in response to the war in Ukraine. These sanctions have shown countries in Europe how dependent they were on Russian energy and countries like Russia how dependent they were on Western imports and the global financial system. The result has been a shift to economic self-sufficiency on both sides. Other countries have been watching and taking note, including China, 
which has seen how Russia has been sanctioned and is trying to avoid similar impacts should it ever consider moving on Taiwan. Tensions between the US and China are also ratcheting up though. This is specifically in relation to not only the Taiwan issue, but the broader question around high-end technologies such as computer chips. If you want the TLDR on that, then I encourage you to watch my video on it. You know where to go. Now, in the end, what all this geopolitical fragmentation means is not only higher inflation, but also a higher equity risk premium. Company earnings need to account for these events, which are becoming less of a tail risk and more of a new normal. You can see exactly what that looks like in their chart over here with the BlackRock Geopolitical Risk Index. This has been surging ever since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. On to the next page though, and this is on a pretty hot button topic right now, the transition to clean energy. Quite simply, the authors think that this transition is likely to accelerate in the coming years. This will be boosted by, quote, significant climate policy action, by technological progress reducing the cost of renewable energy, and by shifting societal preferences as physical damage from climate change and its costs become more evident. For example, they refer to the EU's efforts to build clean energy infrastructure to wean itself off Russian energy. They quote the EU's Repower EU plan, the most recent measure to facilitate this transition. I would take this with a grain of salt though, and that's because there are many who point to the bloc's move to green energy and lack of investment in fossil fuels as one of the reasons it had become so reliant on Russian gas. This had the embarrassing result of countries such as Germany having to restart coal-fired power plants, for example. The authors also point to the Inflation Reduction Act, which they say is poised to unleash a great deal of spending on renewable energy. Globally, you can see what this investment in renewable energy looks like. It has been steadily increasing over the past few years, and the authors expect it to surpass $2 trillion in 2030. This obviously means that those companies that benefit from these clean energy investments are likely to be strong performers in this new regime. However, the authors do note that oil and gas will still be needed to meet this future energy demand under any plausible transition. It's good to see that they acknowledge that moving to renewable sources too quickly can have severe economic implications if traditional oil and gas investments fall too fast. What's interesting about this is that BlackRock is itself admitting that the transition to clean energy has to be balanced. Perhaps this is further admission by them that their aggressive push of ESG investing mandates may have had unintended consequences. More about that in the description. Moving on though, the authors expand on a similar theme on this page over here, and that's the quote, long view on infrastructure. Quite simply, they think that although private markets, i.e. non-listed companies, have valuations that don't reflect the market reality, there are unique opportunities in infrastructure. More specifically, investments in roads, airports, and energy infrastructure have considerably been lagging behind demand over the last couple of years. Now, this can be seen in the following chart, where according to World Bank data, there's a $15 trillion gap between existing infrastructure spending and what's needed to meet global demand. They also refer to the $400 billion in spending that will come from the Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of that in the aforementioned sustainable energy sector. They make a compelling pitch for infrastructure in that these assets can diversify returns and provide stable cash flows. Moreover, infrastructure investments are generally less dependent on economic cycles than corporate earnings are. Finally, infrastructure assets can have contracts that stretch for decades and can also provide an inflation hedge. Now, the last two pages are where the authors bring everything together to give us their view on how portfolios should be structured from both a strategic and tactical standpoint. Strategic 
being investing for the long term and tactical being for the next six to 12 months. So let's quickly run through some of these, shall we? When it comes to equities, they are underweighting them in the short term and overweighting them in the longer term. As was covered earlier in the report, over 10 years, equities are likely to provide better long-term returns than fixed income assets. However, in the short to medium term, central bank tightening is still likely to hammer stocks and many equity valuations are still not pricing in this damage. Then, when it comes to credit, they are strongly overweight in the longer term and also overweight in the short term. As we've covered, they are confident in the strong corporate balance sheets as well as the high yields that an investor can attain on these. Of course, they do stress that the focus should be on quality credit assets, i.e. investment grade. In the government bond bracket, they're underweight both in the short and longer term. However, they do take different views in terms of the different bond brackets. More specifically, strongly underweight in nominal bonds and Chinese bonds, overweight in inflation-linked bonds. When it comes to bond terms, they're neutral on the shorter-term government bonds, but underweight longer-term ones. As they have stated, the market has not adequately priced in high and persistent inflation, something that can eat away at long-term bond valuations. And finally, when it comes to private markets, they are generally underweight in the longer term. They don't have a view in the shorter term, and that's just because these assets are longer term commitments. They're not easily liquid and can't be seen as a short term hedge. Now, drilling down a bit further, they are neutral on private credit, but underweight private growth assets. So that's the high level of where BlackRock is seeing portfolio allocation in 2023 and beyond. Over here on the next page, they go into even more detail, such as the geos of the equity assets and the types of fixed income assets. However, I'm not going to go over all that here, but I do encourage you to take a look through the report at your leisure. I will, of course, leave it linked to in the description for you. OK. So that's it for the breakdown. But now the big question, of course, is what it means for you. Well, I think there are a number of things that we can take from this report. Firstly, it's that inflation is going to remain high for the foreseeable future. This means that the Fed is unlikely to pivot anytime soon as it maintains its hawkish stance to crush said inflation. So, we need to be prepared for an environment with high interest rates, high inflation, and lower growth. To me, this sounds like stagflation, and in some countries in Europe, this is already a reality. This is why BlackRock thinks that fixed income assets are good short-term plays until we eventually see that pivot. Higher interest rates makes investing in investment-grade credit a strong hedge for the next 6 to 12 months. However, equities, as well as longer-dated government bonds, are likely to still face some headwinds. There's the chance that the central bankers do pivot sooner and adjust their inflation targets higher. If that is the case, it could be a boon for risk assets, especially those that have fully priced in the damage to the economy. In that case, you're going to want to carefully consider your strategic asset allocation. The 60-40 split is no longer relevant in today's new regime. Geopolitical risk, carbon neutral, greenflation and deglobalization have changed the relationship between bonds and equity. It's important to dynamically adjust the allocation as we transition to the new normal. Is it a new normal we all want? Well, not really. But it's one which we can prepare for. And I hope today's breakdown of this report somewhat helped to that end. And now I want to hear from you guys. When do you think the Fed will pivot, if at all? How would you invest in this high rates, high inflation environment? Let me know in the comments below. In the description, you can also find links to all the other places that you can follow me. That is Twitter, Telegram, Instagram, and TikTok. If you want a preview of what videos are about to be released, as well as what my personal portfolio looks like, 
then you should also sign up to my free newsletter. All of that is down below. And finally, if you think this crypto guy did a fine job, well, smash up that like button. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button as well. Till next time, folks, stay warm, stay safe and stay crypto. Thank <laughs> you.